Herkese merhaba arkadaşlar. Karşımızda Scott Hanselman ve konu- son konumuz. Hi Scott. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. Ben daha fazla uzatmadan Ömer Güray'a ve Scott'a sahneye bırakıyorum ve iyi sunumlar diliyorum. Thank you. Hello Scott. Are you okay? Are you cool? I'm very well. How are you? Uh, I'm good too. I don't want to take your time and you can start right now. If you, any, if, you have, if you have any question, you can just write to chat or just send, say to me. That'd be great. And okay. uh, I, I'm very excited to be here and I'm very happy to have as many questions as I can have. So I will give my presentation and I wish that you would interrupt me and have questions and uh, we'll have a fine, a fine chat. Of course, we will have a lot of questions and I'm so excited too. Maybe I can do some uh, pronunciation mistake. Please forgive me. I apologize for not speaking the language. Okay, thank you. Okay, you can start. Hey, everybody. So my name is Scott Hanselman, and this talk that I'm going to give here, I call the art of computers. Um, and I I was told when I made my slides that these are not a nice font. You shouldn't use this font. So I'm going to make this font better. And then I was told that you should have like a picture that shows what your office looks like and maybe your slides should not have a white background so then i made a background that looks more like this but then i was told that you should actually show your real office and not a fake office like this so here's a more reasonable office for a computer person one of the things that's interesting about being in software as long as i've been in software is almost 30 years is that I've been able to fail for a very long time. When people are early in career, the first four or five years is really challenging. It can be really difficult because you are trying to get experience, you're trying to get a job, and everyone around you has more experience. One of the things that I'm trying to work on as a person who has is later in their career when I talk to people who are earlier in their career is to give them a place where they can fail safely. Sometimes we feel like we have to be the best and perhaps our colleagues, our friends, the other students, the other early in career people are better than we are. And we get what's called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome means that you feel like you're an imposter or a fake or a phony. And that can be really challenging. So I just want to welcome everyone who is joining us today, whether you are in your career one year, five years, or 20 years. I know that we have some professionals here. We have some students here, maybe some professors and some teachers, people from all over. And that's great. I really like this magazine from uh, the US that was from 1984, 1984. And this is from the Texas Instruments TI-89 Computer Users Group. And this is a young woman who is programming a Texas Instruments computer. And the reason that I like this picture is that it reminds us that we can have uh, a computer experience and a programming experience that's for everyone, for everyone. I hope that technology welcomes everyone, uh, including whether it be young women, or people from anywhere, computers are for everyone. <clears throat> so the question then is, are computers art or computers a science? If you're a programmer, is this a science where only the best programmers can think about things like science? Or is computing and is programming more squishy? Is it more of an art? So I want to talk about some of the, some of the things that have helped me in my career. And um, if there are any questions and there's a chat, please feel free to ask the questions. And our friends uh, in the control panel there in the control center will give me the questions and I'll answer the questions in, in real time. Because right now this is live, right? And I'm in Portland, Oregon. You can go and Google for Portland, Oregon and see where I am right now. So these are the things that I break down when I think about programming about computers and about technology in general problem solving layering composition and patterns 
And the first thing I'm going to talk about is problem solving. And I'm going to compare an older programmer like me. I've been coding for almost 30 years professionally and almost 40 years as an amateur. Problem solving is answering yes, no questions at scale. Have you ever had a time when you were working on a coding problem, and you were going for hours and hours, and you asked help of a senior engineer, and that engineer maybe came over, looked at your screen and said, oh, it's that, and then pushed a button, and then it worked. And you've been sitting there for hours trying to understand what the problem was. And then the senior engineer just knows the answer. You have to ask yourself, how did they know that? Am I not a good programmer? Am I, do I have to work harder? Why did they know and I didn't know? What they're able to do is ask yes, no questions at scale. They have a bank of questions in their minds. I've been doing this so long that I can ask, oh, is it this or is it this? Is it this or is it this? And I can solve problems really quickly. What we need to do when we are welcoming new programmers into technology is make sure that they feel safe and comfortable that they can ask questions and not have someone say, that's a stupid question. Think about what that would feel like if someone asks a question they just want to understand what's going on. They just want to uh, be a better programmer. And then we, the, the, the senior engineers, the older engineers go, oh, oh, saying that's so dumb. What a dumb question. That's a horrible feeling. There are no dumb questions. There are no dumb questions. So when I teach young people how to program, one time recently, I was teaching some young women how to program. And I said, hey, everyone, hey, kids, let's go learn how to code. And they're like, yay, we're going to learn how to code. I said, OK, here we go. We're going to learn how to code. My toaster is broken. And then I just waited, and I had a long pause. And the young, the young people were like, what's a toaster have to do with programming? I want to write some code. I want to understand how to do computers. I said, yeah, but I need breakfast. I have no toaster. My toaster is broken. What do you think is wrong with it? So let's think about that. How do we debug my toaster? Well, simple thinking, simple thinking might be you should buy a new toaster. That doesn't really solve the problem. It just says, we don't know what the problem is. Let's buy a new toaster. Let's just solve it by replacing the computer entirely. That's not a good answer. Let's talk about systems thinking. We spend a lot of time trying to teach people how to code when we should be trying to teach them how to think. So what is the difference between coding and systems thinking? So here is uh, a toaster that's broken. One of the young women said, is the power on? That's a great question. That's an excellent question because now that person is not thinking about the toaster. They're thinking about the toaster and how it fits into the world, into the larger world. And I said, okay, yes, the power is on. Then they said, maybe we should plug something else in. Maybe we should plug in a light and see if that works. Now we're starting to debug the problem. This might not seem like coding, but these are the kinds of things that we find ourselves being asked when we are doing programming. So far, a lot of these questions are not uh, about the toaster. Then we can say, did it blow a fuse? One of the young women had a really great question that said, is there any power on the house at all? Is any lights on? That would be a problem for the toaster. Then the best question, the best question ever, do the neighbors have power? One of the young ladies said, look outside and see if the neighbor's lights are on. So think about that for a second. I want toast. And she says, do the neighbors have power? That's a great 
programmer right there. That's a person who would be a natural coder because they're thinking about how things work. They're thinking about the power in the, in the city and how that relates to their toaster giving them toast. And then one of them said, well, maybe aliens have destroyed the power grid. Maybe there was an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse. And these are the kinds of fun questions. Hey, hi. Hey, uh, I have a great question in chat. Yes. Uh, which one is better, asking questions to seniors or try to pin answer yourself in the in internet? That is from, a great question. That is from a great question. Good. Yeah, thank you so much. So early in career programmers, they Google a lot. They go and search around because what they're doing is they're trying to ask seniors. If you Google for something, you are asking seniors. You're asking later in career people because they maybe they wrote it on the internet. So the only difference between you Googling and you asking a trusted senior is one of the people you trust and one of the people is a stranger. So the question then is, do you think that you should ask a senior engineer that you trust or a stranger for the answer? It's interesting, yes? Yes. Right. So I think both are good. I think when you get to a website, you have to ask yourself, does this seem like a good answer? Why does this person know the answer? I like it when I Google for something and I find a blog post of a trusted person with a face and a name. I don't really like it when I go to a forum and I find a, you know, a Simpsons cartoon character and I don't know anything about that person. So then I would ask myself, you know, should I call you or should I ask the stranger on the internet? You have to look at the internet and ask yourself, is this a good answer? Does this person know what they're talking about? Because you don't wanna just copy paste directly from the internet into your code. At the same time, the senior that you work with, your professor, your parents, your friends, your coworkers, they may not necessarily know the right answer. They may tell you that they know the right answer and you have to think for yourself. So I like to collect answers from multiple places and then decide for myself if I think that it's a good idea. The interesting part here, if we look at the slide, is that early in career people go and Google. Later on, uh, someone can ask a question, yes or no? Is the power on? Yes or no? And it eliminates an entire class of problems. So for example, on the left here is a list of problems that I put in. I just came up with these on the top of my head of things that could be wrong with my website. Maybe something with IP address, SSL certificates, date times, permissions, um, a file is locked. I can ask these questions really, really, really quick in my head because I've been doing this so long. Some of these questions you may also have. You may say, oh yeah, it's probably environment variable or something changed uh, or a connection string is wrong. This is our uh, very, very old American president, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he is over 200 years old. And he says that it's probably DNS is probably the problem with your website. Early in career programmers don't have this list in their heads. They're collecting their own list. And my list is going to be different than your list, is gonna be different than uh, you know, uh, Muhammad's list. And then when we work as a team, now we have all of our lists together and we can solve problems as a team, which is I think really nice. The trick is though, if I'm never allowed to ask these questions, then how will I ever learn? We need to make sure that people feel safe to ask questions. And it's our job as later in career senior engineers to give them that space to ask questions, be wrong, and then learn. And then they will collect their own list of questions when they're going and doing problem solving. Next, we can talk about layering. Layering is one of the interesting ways that we hide information. Layering is vertical and hides complexity from myself and from others. The computer is a stack. And when I decide to go and say, open a file and write to the disk, I don't think about the disk, it just writes to the file. 
Yes, sir. I have one question. I have one more question. Mm. I know that you are managing so many people and projects at Microsoft. During the pandemic, how do you handle the, the job management? Yeah. Everyone do want to know this. Yeah. Um, well, so trying to manage things that are complicated, we use layers like this, just as there are, there's Satya at the top, and there's a there's many, many layers. And my boss is uh, Scott Hunter. His boss is Amanda, and Amanda's boss is Julia. Each person has their own uh, specific jobs, and we try to hide complexity from them. Scott Guthrie, who owns Azure, he doesn't know everything about Azure. He only knows what he needs to at the layer that he is. So when we do layering, we are trying to both when we're coding and when we're managing, hide complexity. That's the whole point of doing layering. So I have a team that works for me. And for example, James on my team manages some things with the .NET community. So I can give him a strategy and then he can take care of the tactics of the plan to specifically decide how he wants to do something. And that gives me the flexibility where I don't have to know everything because this is so important. You, if, I, if I say write to a file, the file gets written. Do you think about the hard drive? Was it your job to spin the hard drive and, and move the heads? No, you trust the hard drive to do its job. Scott Guthrie trusts me to do my job and I trust James on my team to do their job and, and on and on and on. And sometimes layering is actually lying. We're lying to ourselves because we're hiding information so much. I might open a file, save the file. I thought it was on the local hard drive, but maybe it really went to Azure. And we lied to ourselves with an API. We lied to ourselves with a function. And it's important to remember that sometimes the computer lies to, to us. It's also interesting to point out that some things in computering look simple, like sending an email. I'm sure that you send email all the time and you don't think about what's behind it. You don't look at the protocol. But I'm curious, Hussein, have you uh, like done a HTTP post? Have you ever looked at the form of an HTML page and then you press F12 and you look behind it and you see the protocol? Have you done that before? Yeah, I did it. Yeah. So do you know what the code behind an email looks like? Uh, actually, I don't know. All right. So this is behind an email. So it's name, value, name, value. And then there's a boundary. So here's the plain text of the email. And here's an HTML email. So if you send an email, it can include plain text and it can include HTML in the email. And you see this part here that says multi-part. It has multiple parts. Here's one part, here's another part. So that's an email, but we don't see that. We only see this. Okay, but you do know what HTML looks like. Yes, so there's HTML. That's, that's an HTTP post. Post to this place with HTTP. Look at this multiple parts, name, value pairs. So email, HTTP post. Surprising how similar they are, yes? Yes. So this means if you know HTTP and you understand how the internet works, you may know more about email and things like that, then you realized maybe all ideas grow out of other ideas. HTML is text that uses HTTP over a port. Email is the same, it's text over a port with a different protocol and a different port, but it's all just text. And it's important to remember that even though it's easy to go into a browser and press F12 and see inside, and it's not easy to do that with email. 
it's still just name value pairs, which means, do you know what this object here is? What is this on the right here? Uh, I don't know. Have you ever seen a record player? Yeah. Where you have music? I've seen and it. this is a needle? Uh, actually, I don't know its name. It's a record player. So let me show you. This one, old version, I guess. Very old, excellent. Yes, record very player. old. You've probably seen maybe this one. Yeah, I saw it in films or some movies. In films, yes, exactly. So an old record player. So here's an old one. Here's a new one. And the music is on the disc, right? So the music is on the disc. And then what's this on the left? That's inside a hard drive. So isn't it interesting that this 100-year-old record player has a disc, has information, and a needle, and this hard drive has a disc that spins with data and a, a head that reads it? Hard drives and old records are still information in a circle that spins. CDs, DVDs, same thing, information in a circle that spins that we can read. This means that in technology, we've been reusing good ideas for hundreds and hundreds of years. If it's a good idea, then we should probably keep using it. So the hard drive and the DVD and the record player are very, very similar, even if they don't seem like they're the same. Make sense? All right. It's interesting. It's a different way to think about it, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So this is an interesting thing to think about when you think about history in general, how these things work. There's so many things that you take for granted. That, that term, I take it for granted. You just write to a file and the hard drive spins. Or now a hard drive is an SSD. This is a new hard drive. For me as an old person, I find it amazing that that's a hard drive. It doesn't yes. spin at all. And it's too small. It's too small, it's too tiny. And then even smaller, my SD card. So that's a hard drive and that's a hard drive. I feel maybe I would accidentally swallow this and I would lose a terabyte of data if I eat that accidentally. This is a sh tiny, tiny thing. But I still, as a programmer, I write to a file. File.open, file.write, doesn't matter. It just works because layering works. Now, I'm curious, do you, do you drive a car? Yeah, I'm driving, have been two years. Two years driving. Does it yeah. have a shifter? Do you drive a shifter? Yes. Do you go like, yeah. you know, or is it yeah. automatic? Shifter. I'm using shifter. shifter. Okay, yeah. cool. So when um, some people, they don't have a shifter. They have an automatic car. Yeah. They just push the gas and it drives. It was easier. It's easier. It is easier, right? Yeah. Because you don't have to think, and then that other hand, you don't have to move it. Yeah. When you're driving the shifter, you know more about the car. You can feel the gears, yes. and if you miss the shift, you can yeah. go. You have to hear the um, engine's voice. You can hear the voice of the engine. I love that. That's exactly right. Now, if you have a flat tire, do you know how to fix the tire? Yes, I know it. I have okay. to know it. You have to know it. You have to know it. OK. Um, do you have Uber? or Taxify or something like that? Uh, we have both, Taxi and Uber. You have but okay, Taxi cool. is more than Uber. Okay, so if you take a taxi and you're, the, you're, the, not, the, you're not the driver of the taxi, you're just mm -hmm. the rider. Yeah, I'm just, just customer. Taxi. Do you have to know how to change the tire? No, I don't have to. Yeah, because you pay the taxi guy. Yes. And if the taxi breaks down, you get out of the taxi and you walk away and you're like, sorry, taxi guy. Yeah. Right now, your car, do you know how to take apart the engine and reassemble it into another car? 
Uh, actually, no. <laughs> okay, because you don't really need to because you hire a mechanic, yes. right? Computers are the same way. How far down do you want to go? You can replace the memory in your computer probably. You can buy a new hard drive. Can you make a CPU from scratch? No, you pay Intel. Yes. You pay AMD to do that for you. So when we're coders, we have to ask ourselves, what layer do we stop? What layer do I stop? If I'm an Uber rider or a taxi rider, I just want to go to, to work. I don't care about your tire. I don't care about your engine. I'm going to live at this layer of abstraction. But you have a car, so you live at this layer. And you want to know about your tires, so you live at this layer. If the engine breaks, then you hire a, a doctor, a car doctor, right? A mechanic. Yes. And then they know. And if they don't know, then they call the manufacturer of the car. And the car, then they send parts. The same layering that systems thinking applies in all aspects of technology. So if we go back to our slides here and we look at these, uh, these things, we're looking at a disk that spins with information on it and the information is pulled out of a needle right here and comes up and the audio comes out here. And the hard drive spins, the head picks it up. And actually these are the heads here. These come in and this spins and the information is encoded like this. Very, very similar. But I don't have to think about that, whether it's like this or whether it's like that. Make sense? It's a yes, different way sense. to think about computers. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Mohammed, can you share it? Uh, what do you think about importance of calculus, linear algebra, discrete math in uh, computer science? And what do you think the, what do you think about the college? There are a lot of known known people who are college dropped out. For example, <laughs> Bill Gates or something. Yeah, that's a great question. So I had to take calculus because the computer professor said I had to take calculus. I have not used calculus in 30 years. So it depends on the work that you're doing. If you're a data scientist, you will need calculus. Uh, I think personally that linear algebra is useful. I think discrete math is useful. But just as we're talking about our cars, and thinking about your car, would it be useful if you learned how to take apart an engine? No. Well, until it is. It would be not useful. And then one day your car will break. And then you'll be like, ah, oh, I wish I learned how to fix the engine. Calculus is the same thing. I can live probably my whole life without needing to know calculus. But then one day I might say, oh, I have a problem and I wish I knew calculus. So we have to decide what we're going to spend our time on and what we're going to think about. Uh, now, the question about being a college dropout is an interesting one because um, what is college for? Is college for teaching us everything we need to know? Colleges no. is for teaching us how to learn. They should tell us that when they enter college. We're not, we're not saying, come to college and we'll teach you everything we need to know. I'll put the knowledge in your brain and I will send you off to get a job. What we're doing is we're teaching you how to learn on your own. Because as programmers, as people in tech, we're going to spend the next 20 or 30 years of our career learning new stuff. We have to. Most of the languages that I learned in college, I don't use anymore. I haven't written in Pascal or Haskell or C in years. C Sharp, the language that I choose to, to, to use, did not exist when I went to college. So did I go to college to learn C Sharp? No, I went to college to learn how to think. Now, should I drop out of college? College is a piece of paper that you kind of need depending on where you want to go. If I want to visit you next year and come to Geek Day, I'm going to need a passport. And I'm going to need a visa. 
So then if I said, what do you think about people without passports? There's a lot of known people who have no passports. I'm like, well, they probably snuck in to the, to the country. I wonder if that's a problem, right? I don't think you need a college degree. I don't think you need a passport, but it is nice to have it. It's a piece of paper that has value. It is a useful piece of paper. It's up to you and I to decide how useful that piece of paper is and whether I want to fight for it. Um, when I went to, to college, I got a two-year degree. Do they have two-year degrees that side? Not a four-year yeah. degree, but a two-year degree. We have both. We have two and uh, four-year degree. Okay. So I got a two-year degree, which was enough to get a small job, but not enough to get a big job. And then I kept going to school at night. So I was working in the daytime and then at night going to work on my four-year degree. My four-year degree took 11 years. It's too long. I was working. <laughs> I had a life. I had a, you know, I got married. Um, so I didn't want to give up though. So a little bit at a time, a little bit at a little time, I was taking uh, classes in order to get my four-year degree. And at that point, I was doing it for myself. That's great. That's awesome. And it's a long time. It is a long time. <laughs> and it, this was very clear answer. That's a very good question. So let's go back to the slides and think about composition. When we compose things, we make them up of other things. So when we model reality, uh, these composition models have different relationships. Now, do you have Netflix? Yeah. All people, I guess all people have Netflix. All people have Netflix. Do you know who this guy is? He's from a TV show called Altered Carbon. Yes, Altered Carbon. I have watched it. Yeah, yeah. Altered Carbon TV show. So on the show, this guy is an AI. Okay. So he's actually a computer. And uh, in, the, in the TV show, he plays a hotel that is a computer. And I saw him tweeting, the man, the actor, his name is Chris Connor. He was tweeting, and I saw he was in Portland, Oregon. And I'm in Portland, Oregon. So I tweeted back, hey, I think you're great. You know, can we hang out? Maybe we can do a podcast. So then I got to meet him, and we got to hang out. And he's super cool. He's like the nicest guy. So we went and we recorded a podcast. I went there with a hard drive, with an SD card, and I recorded a show with him. And he was very charming, and you can listen to the show. But then I went home, and I put the hard drive into my computer. And this is what I saw. Have you ever seen a folder that has no name? No, it's like it's empty. This is me looking for my files. Not only did it have no name, but it recursed on top of itself. So as you opened it, it was infinite all the way down, totally empty. So at this point, I'm thinking, this man is going to hate me forever. How can I be his friend if I've lost the 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 podcast interview do i call him back and say can we do it again i mean i thought i was going to die this was the worst feeling ever but i went into windows and i could see that there was some space used up so this tool said i had 28 gigs free and 300 megs used but explorer said it was empty so what do I do? What would you do? Actually, no. How can it be possible? How can it be possible? Well, remember, it's lying to me. That's how computers work. And sometimes the lie works, and sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes you have a flat tire. Sometimes you have a sick engine. Sometimes your shifter doesn't feel right. Sometimes the noise of the engine is wrong but everything can be fixed. So I need to flip this upside down, just like I did with email. What's behind this dialog box? There's nothing in the computer 
that you can't see. So I flipped it and I looked at the back because I want to see what's behind it. And you can see that there are there's documentation and there are things that should be a certain way. And if they're not that way, you can fix them because it's all just bytes. Remember how I said you write to the disk and it just works? Until it doesn't. Something went wrong. So the question is, is the data completely gone or is it there somewhere? You can see I've got a lot of zeros, but then here I've got file access table 32, FAT32, file access table. So I can dig around and I can start to understand what's going on if there's some corruption you can see that there's no there's no name so i've got a lot of zeros here that maybe shouldn't be zero but maybe i can fix these so i don't know anything about file systems i don't know anything about how to fix this but i know how to learn so i can read and i can write code and i made an image of the file because I didn't want to lose, I, I didn't want to destroy the disk. So I got an imaging program and I made a copy of the file of the entire disk, byte for byte for byte. See the IMG, I made an image file. So what's interesting about this, you see how there's two backslashes there? Remember that I said it was an empty folder, like the folder had no name. Imagine if a folder had the name null. You would see backslash, the name, and then backslash, and then a name. But instead, we have backslash, backslash. I had a folder that was a, a lie. It was a phantom folder. And Windows Explorer could not deal with that. It could not show me that so instead it showed me empty folders there was a folder underneath it though called zoom 03 and my files were there but windows couldn't show me that because it did not understand how to have a folder with a null name how long does it take to understand it uh, <laughs> uh i think it was about 16 hours Oh, it's too long. <laughs> <laughs> 14, 15, 16 hours. But it was either that or I call my new friend uh, and tell him that I need his time. So the question then is, is it worth 16 hours of my time to not waste his time? So I want to be friends with this actor because he's very nice and I like him. So I should probably take a little bit of my time so that I don't waste his. Yes. Uh, can so we remember see the video? I said, <laughs> what's that? Can we see the video? Do you have? The, well, oh, the, uh, the pod, you mean the, uh, the podcast? Yes. Yeah. So he is here. Episode 729. Okay. Thank you. So podcast Hansel minutes, episode 729. Okay, I will watch uh, watch this after the this presentation. <laughs> uh, by so, the way, I have uh, one yeah. more question for you. Sure, Mohamed, can you give it? What about the age? Is it possible to be good at something after a certain age, like twenty five or thirty? <laughs> Everybody, how old do you think? This. How old do you think I am? Uh, forty. Or fifty. Are, Do you think you, I'm good at stuff? Yeah, you seem too younger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so right now, my family and I are taking Taekwondo. Are you familiar with Taekwondo? Uh, I don't know. It's like a martial art, like karate. Oh, interesting. I'll show you. I'll show you. It's better. <laughs> Oh, Taekwondo, okay, okay. I got right now. Right? Yeah. So later this year, I'll get a black belt. Whoa. I started 
when I was 45. 45? Yeah. Not, so the question is, is it possible to be good at something after a certain age, like 45? I haven't been doing Taekwondo for 15 years. I've been doing it for five. I guess everybody take the answer. <laughs> so the answer is yes, absolutely. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be better than someone who started when they were 16. But the only thing that the youth have that the old people don't have is that your bodies work better. But you're going to get smarter and smarter and smarter, and you're going to get more and more experience. So, yes, it is absolutely possible to be good at something when you're older than 25. I guarantee it. Okay. And actually, let me skip to the next part because that brings us to patterns. So what is good about being experienced and being older and being in tech a long time? And this is why I want you all to be in tech for a long time. Because the only difference between you and me is I've seen that before. If we have a problem, I'm going to say, I've seen that before. Well, how? Well, I've been here a long time. Doesn't mean I'm smarter. It just means I've seen a lot more stuff. Also, you are smarter. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, there's a big difference, right? You know, wisdom is just seeing things before and pattern recognition. So um, you, you, you'll notice that a lot of my stories involve me spending hours debugging, 16 hours, 13 hours. I think we've all had those experiences where we've spent many, many, many hours debugging a problem. If I debugged that problem with the file system for 16 hours and then it happened again, do you think it would take another 16 hours for me to, to debug it? Um, maybe less. Not Probably less. I would hope yeah. so less, yeah. Like if you've changed, how many times have you changed a tire? Uh, five. Five so times. I'm very good in that. You're pretty good, right? Yeah. The fifth time is quite good, yes? First time it was so hard. I do. It, I did it with my father. That so you did it with someone who'd done it before. Yes. Now you understand. So the 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 more times you do something, the better that you get, right? So every time you try something for the first time, you're going to suck at it. Sucking at something. Sucking means being bad. Sucking at something is the first step to being good at something. Everyone says, oh, I tried it. I'm not good at math. Did you just start? Then yes, you suck at math. I sucked at Taekwondo the first time I started, and now I suck less. So when I spend hours and hours of doing this kind of work, I'm learning and I'm becoming better at that, and I won't be so bad the next time. One time I had a problem where I was trying to run some code on a Raspberry Pi, you know, the little tiny computers, Raspberry Pi computer? Yeah, I know it. And when I copied this file, it wouldn't work. So I made a folder called good, and I made a folder called bad, and I did a comparison between the two files to try to understand why it worked on one machine and not on the other machine. And then I noticed missing bytes. Two missing bytes. Zero D, zero D. Now, zero D is hex, right? That's base 16. When we count, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D. So D is the number 13. So why is the number 13 missing from my file? It's not a text file. You can see that it's actually a Linux binary. Why, what would strip out all of the number 13s from my stuff? Any ideas? Maybe because of the bad luck? Because of bad luck. Because <laughs> 13 is bad luck. That's actually a pretty good, I've never heard that answer. That's a very good answer. I like that. Because <laughs> of Thank bad you. luck. <laughs> I like that one. That's good. Well, so do you know what ASCII is? Yeah, we all know it. 
right? American standard for character or something, something. Well, in ASCII, if we look at the ASCII table, Thirteen is a carriage return, and ten is a line feed. Okay, what's a carriage? What's it returning? What does carriage return even mean? Actually, not know right now. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's go out to the command line, and I'm going to bring up. An old terminal. Don't you think all terminals should look like this? This is the best kind of terminal. I have never seen this before. Now, this is the Windows terminal, but I just applied an old filter. Uh, we have a black one. <laughs> yeah. So oh. watch, I can go I can go like this. I think it looks super cool. Yes. Then I can just go like that and it goes back. All right, so let's make a folder. It's empty. I'm going to say notepad ABC. And actually, you know what I'll do? Let's grab an I in there too. A, B, C, and then the Turkish I, okay? So we have four bytes, yes? Yes. Okay, so let's look at the file. Five bytes, that's interesting. Uh, end of line? Well, Turkish I's are different. They're special. Let's just remove it. We'll have A, B, C. Turkish I takes two bytes there. So you see how we have ABC. Now I'm going to push enter. Just push enter one time. Save it. Two bytes. That's weird. Let's open it up in Visual Studio Code. So now I'm going to take that file, and I want to look at it as hex. A, B, C, 13, 10. OK? It's more clear right now. Carriage return, line feed. So let's return ourselves. What is a carriage? You've seen this before? Yeah, I have seen it. Seen it. You you put the paper here. You turn this if you want to make the paper go. And then you press this and that whole top part is called the carriage. So when you type, you go do 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 the carriage goes like this and it it carries just like a carriage takes a person, a carriage and a typewriter takes a paper to the other side, then you push it and you go bing, and you return the carriage. So if this person here is typing, see the carriage moving? Watch the top. How he's, he's feeding lines, and then move the carriage. Yes. Carriage return. Now it's moving. See, typing, type, whoop, carriage return. Type, 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 type. It's moving, moving. Carriage return, line feed. You see it happen? Right here. Carriage return, line feed. He did it with his hand, right? He did a carriage return with his hand. Well, when you are writing a text file in, in, in 2021, in the year 2021, those are the encodings for ABC, 
that says carriage return and that says line feed because your text file has enough information in it that it could tell the system to return the carriage of the typewriter. But you don't have a typewriter, but your text file has enough information. Well, when I was copying my file to the Raspberry Pi, I said, treat files without an extension as ASCII. So it saw that my file did not say .exe. It was just a file. It had no extension. So it converted it from Linux and Windows, and it returned, it removed the carriage return. Because if I'm on Windows, I have a carriage return and a line feed right down here. This is in Visual Studio Code. Your Visual Studio Code says this right now, but you don't ever look at that. It's at the very bottom. See, it says CRLF, carriage return, line feed. If I change it to Linux, now it says line feed. I haven't noticed it yet. I don't check it before. No, you don't check it because it just works, right? So now I save this. Let's look at the hex now. Just Linux one. does not use a carriage return. Linux says only line feed. So no one has used or thought about a typewriter in 50 years. But Windows and Linux thinks about it every day. And you use it all the time and you never notice. Even if you're using Git, you think about this. So pattern recognition. When I saw this, I said, oh, carriage return. Where have I seen that before? 0D means 13, which means a carriage return. My FTP client was quietly removing the carriage return because it thought that my program was a text file. And because it removed the 13, the program could not run anymore. So now the next time you run into a problem like that, you're going to see that. You're going to remember. You're going to say, oh, I've seen that before. And now you won't have to spend 13 hours trying to debug a problem like that. Thanks to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to computers and programming. So as we get towards the end of our talk here, I want to remind ourselves and our friends that are listening that we are all amateurs. Everybody is learning all the time. There's no professionals. Everyone is just learning, learning, learning. And if someone might say, I have 20 years experience, you have to ask yourself, do they really have 20 years experience or is it the same year 20 times? Are they not learning new things all the time? I said that I've been programming for 30 years, but I, to be honest with you, some of those years, I don't remember because I wasn't really learning. Maybe five or seven of those years were the same year because I was just going to work. I wasn't really awake. I wasn't really conscious and thinking about my own learning. So some of those years are lost. So try to be focused on learning new things. And remember this person here. Do you know who this guy is? Uh, actually, I don't know. OK, so this is a great thing to bring up. Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners, see how Google actually auto-completes. Can you read that there? I should know. <laughs> yeah. His name is actually Sir Tim Berners-Lee, like a knight. So he invented the internet. The so let me rephrase. He invented the web. Okay. Look at his job title. This is a little bit of an English language joke, but do you see that he did not say the web developer? He just said web developer like the rest of us. He's a man of the people. He could have said I made the web not senior web developer, but the web developer. 
So he's very humble, and we should all be so humble. We should just remember that it's okay to be. Uh, do, do, have you ever seen the? You have a Swiss Army knife, the little knife that has so many things. Have you ever seen one of these? Yes, I have one of them. Yeah, these are great, right? The thing that's funny about these knives is that they're really kind of bad at everything. Like it's a small knife and it's a small scissors. You know, these are not really good scissors. It's not cutting anything. <laughs> it's not cutting anything. But this is my career. This is my career. I'm a funny little knife that's not good at everything, but I know a lot of little stuff. And I think it's okay to do that. You know, you can be a knife like this and have many, many uh, little small functions. I know a, l a little bit about a lot of things and that allows me to be very flexible. But I really need to remind people to don't skimp on the basics, meaning don't forget the basics. Try to understand CPU, memory, disks, read a little bit about your history and understand how computers and the internet were created and you will be a better programmer and a better technologist even though you'll be a funny little knife that's not good at everything so that is the end of my talk my friends i have one more question for you Mohammed. can yes, you share sir. it Uh, I can't hear you. I think you got muted. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, having you is great pleasure. Choosing a career path is one of the important thing in computer science. When and when and how should we start thinking about that? When did you start thinking about it? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for this one because I did not think about it. I discovered the path. Uh, when the internet started, I thought that that was going to be a big thing. So the internet was my path. And I would say today, uh, the open web is my path. I like HTTP, JavaScript, HTML. Um, I like open source, so I picked C Sharp and .NET. Um, I don't think you have to pick a path. You can change your job, right? You don't have to be one thing your whole life. When you're starting in computer science, you feel like you have to pick one job. And if you pick wrong, then you're dead. You can switch. A very good friend of mine uh, named Ray Bango started in JavaScript, went to .NET, went back to JavaScript, and now he's doing information security. You can switch careers. If I wanted to become a data scientist now, I could go and learn Python, and I could do that because I know how to learn. So I don't think that you have to pick a path and have only one path. Um, you should always be thinking about it. You should always look around and see up and coming new technologies and say, oh, Kubernetes is cool. I'm going to think about Kubernetes. Would I bet my entire career on Kubernetes? No. But I would bet my entire career on web applications. Right? You're not going to bet your entire career on one brand of car, but you might bet on transportation as a general idea and cars in general. This was a great answer again. Uh, I'm looking for chat. Uh, I'm looking to chat for uh, questions, but we, we don't have any question yet. Maybe I'd like to know if the friends, uh, they like the talk, if this was okay. I know this is not they, the same uh, a talk they would expect, but maybe it was one that they thought was okay. They, they were really liked it. And they are so thankful for to you. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to talk with you too. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you for. I want. I want to remind our friends also that we tried something new here, because sometimes I can. You know, someone comes and they give a speech, and they do their speech, and then they hang up. They hang up the phone. Goodbye. Yeah. But when I talked to uh, Hussein and Muhammad, I said, "Can we try something different?" Okay. Interrupt, have a conversation. And you could have said, that's weird. Um, I don't know if I want to do that. Or are you sure? You know, and you did anyway. Mm -hmm. And you popped in and you asked questions and you shared me questions. And I think it makes a better talk. My talk is better because you and the audience are 
having a conversation. Thank you. Thank you. You are so great, man. Thank you for this great presentation. We are out of time right now. It's nice to meet you again. Thank you for everything. Thank you.